All right. Well, we'll go ahead and kick the tires and light the fires. Uh, it's such a pleasure. Little Top Gun analogy. Uh, such a pleasure to be back on the north end of the coast. Uh, I recently uh, just returned from Southern California, LA, and uh, went as far south as San Diego. And uh, fantastic time, I went to see my Russian son, and I'm gonna tell a little bit of his story today because it is about woundedness. And while I was at the San Diego Zoo with my 15-year-old uh, grandson, um, I had a chance to see the lions and the tigers, the alligators, but particularly the lions. I was thinking about a particular story of a missionary named Dr. Livingston. How many people remember him? Yeah, I presume. Yeah, so Dr. Livingston has a unique wounded story. And so I'm just going to share a little bit of it from Google. And so here's what Google tells us briefly. Livingstone was attacked by a lion in 1884 uh, on his marathon journey coast to coast. And so he was trying to shoot the animal, which was eating villagers in a village that he was serving, and he himself got mauled. It crushed his arm, and he had 11 fang marks from the lion itself. And has anybody ever seen a lion? Wow, they're ferocious. Uh, was it David that also killed a lion and a bear too? I want to say that's a pretty tall order, and we have lions and tigers uh, cougars, uh, uh, but definitely bears right here in the state. And I want to say, man, if you've seen one or seen them in their natural habitat, you probably don't want to enter in. It's like, mm, nature's good, but it's good outdoors. I'm going to stay indoors. Back up. So um, Dr. Livingston, in the pursuit of his Christian journeys and trying to save lives of people who were being eaten by this lion, um, he sustained some wounds that were practically fatal. And during the process, uh, he's a single man. His future wife is the one who administers the healing. So here's another example of a wounded healer also being healed himself. And through the process, and it's funny, sometimes when we're wounded, maybe it's by a lion, maybe it's by circumstances, maybe we're doing our Christian duty, wow, we can sustain some wounds that can be grievous to us and maybe even take our life. And we don't think about those things as we go through the process. We think that sometimes when we serve, it's just going to be a safe place, isn't it? Wow, even though it might be the jungles of Africa, right? Even though we're doing a Christian duty and we've got a gun. <laughs> it wasn't enough to save him from his future wife. She tended his wounds took care of him, and a romance developed. A romance that uh, bloomed into a full-blown ministry. It's unbelievable how many people uh, through that wounding were healed as a result. And uh, the families, relationships that were touched by both of them. Uh, when Dr. Livingston died, they said that his heart was buried in Africa. That's where his heart was. That's what his wife said. What a tender thing and what a wonderful thing. Sometimes we look at our wounding as being something that is, oh, it's all bad. We got wounded, we're hurt. But there actually may be other people that are recipients of that and who may see that wounding and see the healing that takes place. I want to say Jesus' own wounding was very much like that, and we looked at that last week. While I was uh, in Southern California, in L.A., with my son, uh, Serge, and his wife, Irina, uh, it reminded me of kind of another story of wounded, woundedness and healing, and um, kind of a remarkable story, but for us, for my wife and I, it's a personal journey that goes back really to about 1989 before anything happened while I was still in the military. Um, a cataclysmic event happened, and I want to say for the most part it was good, but it had consequences it was the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Um, democracy prospered, 
uh, throughout the globe. Uh, Russia fell as an empire. They were struggling past that point. And um, yeah, Russia was over. East Germany was over. Later, uh, the, uh, Germany, East and West become unified. And um, it was right at the time when I knew that my calling in the military was going to be short. It was going to be shortened by that. I didn't know what that call meant, and I didn't know what it was that I was going to be sacrificing. My son asked me, uh, Serge asked me while we were together, we were talking about the Bible, prophecy, and things that have happened. He goes, Dad, what did you give up? What was, what was it that wounded you? Because we talked about woundedness and what it was like. And because that's a topic for all of us across the church, no matter what our circumstances are. And, uh, he's, and so I said to him in response to his question, I said, I guess what I gave up was my career. I gave up the ideas of the things that I thought were important for something that was greater, something that I was uncertain about. And it turned out that at the fall of the Cold War, because Sergei and his family are from Russia, and I can remember my own conflicts in the Cold War, my own struggles with communism, you know, capitalism, and all of the idealism that took place. I can remember saying, well, there'll never be a Russian in my home. I said this morning in our Bible study, be careful what you say, because the Lord is listening. And so, um, just a few years later, as I've entered the mission field, I have a young Russian boy who's 10 years old, and he's been wounded here in America. Uh, his mother, um, uh, Galena, and she told the story at dinner. We kind of revisited uh, almost 30 years back. Now this story is 30 years for us. And what it was like to have to give up a son to send him to America so they had a shot at an education. So they had a shot at a life that was different from the Russia that was falling. And she was a very wealthy person. And she said, I don't, we have money today, but I don't know what tomorrow will bring. The hardest thing I had to say to uh, her and uh, Sergei's future stepfather at that time was, if you have the opportunity to come to America, you should come. And they did. That was almost 30 years ago. Sergei, when he came to us, was 10 years old. Now he's 39. Um, he didn't have any children. Now he has two. He has a wife. Uh, Irena, who was fantastic. His grandmother's here. I had a chance to pray with four generations of his family. You never know what God is going to call you to do. You never know the wounds that you're going to heal. And some of the wounds they sustained, especially Sergei when he came here, they were from the church and church people. How he ended up in our doorstep from Archangel Russia, you know, which is practically in the Arctic Circle. It's closer to the Alaskan um, uh, environment than it is to here in the Northwest. I talked about being cold and living in perpetual air conditioning here, and they were like, oh, that's not cold. <laughs> Let me tell you a Russian cold. <laughs> that's cold. So, uh, yeah, you never know what the woundedness was that caused you to do the things, and you can't see what it's going to be. You won't necessarily know that perhaps your wounding might be healing for another group. So at dinner, I had the chance to go back 30 years of our journey together. They are my family. You know, our relationship, our woundedness, the struggles that we endured, some of them global, some of them personal, the challenges that we had, and they're a believing family. My daughter-in-law, pray for her, she's coming to faith, she is from Uzbekistan, a former Soviet Republic, and she is thinking about um, Allah, Muhammad, the Quran, and Isa, Jesus. And so uh, my grandsons are baptized, but she's the last one. And we're talking about those things. We're talking about those issues. Her whole house is going to come to the Lord. You know, what a praise that is. We thought we gave up some stuff. We got wounded, you know, we had conflicts, world events that took place, and then on the personal level, God showed up. And while I was at Sergei's home, I blessed his home and blessed his business while I was there. 
he has fruit trees and our fruit tree here is already producing fruit. So the camera won't pick it up, but there's a cherry on our cherry tree. And uh, so it's the first offering unto God. The first fruits belong to him. It's a first fruit. Very tiny. It's a cherry, but it qualifies. <laughs> I taught my grandson to play Uno. He wanted to play a card game. I think I taught him how to cheat in the process, but he's very good at it. You know, so there's our Uno. Um, on Saturday's property, he has lots of fruit trees. And this is, this is something from Israel. So we have something, the lulav and the etrog, that we wave at, the, uh, at Sukkot. You know, and they're the species of the land. And so we're thankful for the fruit that's produced, but it's an offering unto God. He has trees, olive trees, uh, grape arbors. It's like a Mediterranean garden. The home that he bought is absolutely beautiful, but it also has the etrog. Uh, it's a citron, this particular kind of lemon. And I thought, Sergey, how is that possible? <laughs> that you can buy a piece of property in Southern California and it has a uh, Mediterranean garden in it and this fruit. And I was thinking about, I knew I was going to bring back some fruit and some things from there, but a lot of times we don't realize it, our suffering produces fruit. It grows something. And I learned something. It's amazing how you can just think you're going to take a journey or a vacation or you're going to spend time with family and then you're going to see the fruit of it. And so here was a piece of the fruit that came from that journey. And so that was my saga. I have some great pictures of some wildlife, including my grandchildren that are in the zoo. And uh, it was fantastic to look at the things that we give up, the ways that we get wounded, and honestly, the way cultures and societies are wounded. So I guess we looked at the big picture in that way and then we looked at all of the pieces, all the way down to the interpersonal kinds of things and the ways that we get wounded. It's funny, because when I look at the big picture of things, I often think, well, what is it, you know, I get wounded, what does that mean? And so we're going to talk just a little bit about that this morning. I'm going to set my fruit down. And uh, so we do get wounded in the journey, don't we? A lot of times we come to church and... There are a lot of wounded people here. And I've heard people, critics say, oh, the church, they're full of wounded people. They're no good. You know, they're all hurt. They can't help us. You know, how are they going to help us? And I say that a little sarcastically, but in many ways, we are a, a wounded people. And we've realized something that maybe others haven't. That some of the things that happen in the globe or some of the things that happen in our lives are beyond our control. They're really beyond us, and we've accepted that fact, or that fact is in front of our face. Hey, I can't help this. I can't help this person that's passing away. Or the fact that a loved one, a child, a mother, a father, they've passed. It's beyond me. I don't understand it. I need help. I'm wounded. I've been hurt by life. And so... Yes, we are a place of wounded people. We're a hospital, but honestly, we need every piece of this hospital. You know, the bandages, the, the spiritual help, the mental help, the physical help. We need every piece. I don't mind being a person on crutches. Uh, I'm glad that the Lord basically said, you know, come to the hospital. I have healing for you. I want to say that's what church people experience. And Jesus makes it easy for us to have a relationship with him because of his woundedness, because of his stripes, we are healed. And so because of that woundedness, we ourselves can help other people by our own experiences. I was going to say something right next to, um, by his stripes, we are healed. Um, we need every bit of this hospital. I need the crutches that basically Christ provides. I need the help, and I would say that our world does too, our communities do too. And if we're not people that basically share those things, man, how horrible that is. But because we're a group of wounded people, 
we sometimes can wound others until we come into our own healing. And, and oftentimes we don't even realize that we've caused a wound. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So I heard somebody once describe ministry or a church is like, uh, like a cluster of grapes. And wine gets its flavor from grapes that are uh, not ripe. Some that are overripe, the raisins. Some that are just right, you know, the, uh, the uh, three bears analogy. And uh, some that are in stages in between. You know, there might be a few rotten grapes on the vine. But the wine gets its character from the cluster. They don't pick the individual grape and throw it in the vat and stomp on it. No, it's the whole cluster that goes in. And that's kind of what we are. God's A-team is people that might be maybe too old to do whatever it is that they do. They might be too young or too experienced, but God doesn't care about those things. And the woundedness, he has a cure for because he is the wounded healer. He invites us in. But oftentimes we come and our guard is down. We don't realize that sometimes when we come to church, we can be wounded. We can be bringing the wounds from the society we can bring in the wounds from work or culture or just our own interpersonal wounds that come in. And that can be a really tough deal. I wouldn't say that we want to keep our guard up in the church, but we want to be aware that, hey, there's probably going to be some other wounded people in our midst. So let's pull up the slides. So uh, wounds uh, to healing, from wounds to healing. And so I want to say, Maybe that's kind of the place that we want to be. We want to be ready to receive whatever that healing is. We want to be able to receive that for others. Let's go on to the next one. Hopefully this is what our unity looks like, what our celebration and our healing from woundedness. And honestly, we've had some members of our congregation who have been physically wounded, spiritually wounded, but they've been wounded, and we have celebrated some of that healing right here, right here in our midst people that we've prayed for, some of the very steps that we have wanted to take, we've taken right here in this congregation, and that applies to us. So I'm going to basically just kind of recap a little bit of some of the woundedness that we talked about, and thank you, Pete, for uh, helping us demonstrate on the blackboard a few weeks ago of what some of those things were, those people that took notes. I'll just review it. We won't really go over it too deep. But the systemic issues are the big system problems. That can be at every level. It can be in our government, it can be in our church, it can be at home. Big level problems. Christian cultural issues can be big problems. Um, it's not like the church, you know, um, I just came from the zoo, and one of the things that we used to say, what makes us similar to the zoo is sometimes lions eat their young, right? And it's so true because when you look at the wars between Catholics and Protestants, between Catholics and other people across the globe, and just church people in general, we can see that a lot of dart throwing, flame throwing, and a lot of eating can take place toward our own community. Some of our denominations were created from fractures. I like to see the garden, but quite frankly, sometimes it's a broken mirror. You know, sometimes it's the fracture that has caused what it is. So we have Christian cultural issues that can also hold us back. And then there's always this, and that has to do with us. It's our own um, interpersonal issues. Some people are friendly. Some people are super hospitable. They practice all the gifts, and it's, they just look perfect in how they display all of the things, but not all of us are like that. So some of us have issues and some of us have baggage. It's funny, when you talk to believers, there are several stories, there's people in between, but you have the believer that's never known a time that they didn't know God. There are believers that are like that, they don't have the baggage maybe that some of us do that didn't know God at some point, but came to know him through some kind of trauma, drama, or conflict that took place. We've got issues, but God is able to handle those things, but we don't know how to connect those things. Initially in the garden, we were created to relate to each other. And we talked about in the Bible study, submission, you know, um, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, 
you know, wives submit, you know, that Paul also makes mention that, uh, be submissive, wives be submissive to their husbands. That's a really tough word. Uh, that uh, level of submission, it's not something that comes natural. And so the key element that's broken in us as human beings is our relationships. And that's where God comes in. People come to church, they want a relationship with Jesus, they see all of these things that flower, they want exactly what that is. They see us come worship, pray together, have barbecues together, and they want all of the elements that we also have. They didn't realize that there are also other wounded people that may have relationship issues and may have other issues that are going on. But all of those factors come in because guess what? We're a big family, we have lots of stuff. Anybody's family perfect? <laughs> yeah, is God perfect? Yes. Does he teach us how to basically relate? Yes. yes. Good. So we are not perfect, but we're learning how. And we're going through the process. Eventually we'll get there, but our relationships are broken. We're constantly working on how we relate to one another and how we do it in God. Question? Comment? Oh, God should have an eraser for the mistakes that we make. Yeah. You know, he does. He promises that he'll throw our wrongs as far as east is from west. Yeah. Well, they don't meet. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So this morning, I wanted to, uh, oh, there's our unity picture. Uh, I wanted to kind of go back and take a look at, so we talked about interpersonal relationships, but I wanted to talk about uh, a few things of how we identify our woundedness, because I'll tell you a secret. Unless you identify what's broken about you or wounded about you, you'll never heal. You'll carry that wound and you'll see through the lens of wounding, you'll see everything through that. So um, here's the first thing that we do, and this is no particular order, but I wanted to share these things. So it's really about five things, but there are a few more. We can add to that list. It isn't complete because, hey, the rabbi said, hey, there's five things. If you do these, you're good. So uh, identify the wound and then process it. So what does that mean? You've got to evaluate what it is. How am I wounded? How do I feel about it? In early learning, in preschool and pre-kindergarten, we teach children how to identify their emotions. When I feel sad, we have a little picture of a sad face. We have to be able to identify with what that looks like. How do I feel about that? How do I deal with that emotion? There's one thing that uh, I'd kind of like to talk about later, and I'll just mention it. Fear and excitement, they elicit the same body chemistry both of those emotions, so when you're afraid, it's the same as being excited. Your body doesn't know the difference. Your brain tells you what the difference is. So some people are afraid of heights, but if you're getting ready to jump out of an airplane, guess what? You gotta tell yourself you're excited. Oh, I'm excited to get out of this plane. I'm so out of here. Look out, here I come. You know, I'm gonna be a yard dart. You're not telling yourself that, that's fear. You're going to jump out of the plane. You're going to do just fine. So there are those kind of things. We have to be able to identify what it is that is driving us. What is the wound that we have? So uh, sometimes it's not always obvious if it's an internal wound. If it's a physical wound, you know, like uh, you've been mauled by a lion and, you know, you've got puncture marks and your, your arm is crushed, that's identifiable. But oftentimes, trauma or emotional scars, we don't always see those. And we don't know until we get to know somebody. Again, it's relational. So if we're hostile, we're dealing with our own wounds, guess what? We see everything from the lens of our own wounds. We can't invite people in. We can't help them because we're still struggling with our own stuff. So we gotta process it. We gotta take the time, and it's individual. I can't say, well, set your watch. You're going to be well now. Oh, now you're well. Well, now you're good. It doesn't work that way. 
except for insurance companies. They'll tell you you're well, you're cut off, that's it. That's all the money we're spending. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's so true. So we have time to process, and for each person, that's going to be just a little bit different. The next step, and I would say this kind of goes along with that, once you identify what that is, and honestly, maybe the person that wounded you, if this is a personal wound, um, is that you've got to think about forgiving. And for the Christian, you can say, well, Jesus forgave you, it isn't an option. But honestly, if you hold on to that unforgiveness, you're the one that's going to be burnt by it. You will never be able to heal. And honestly, as a congregation, you will not be able to invite people in in your woundedness. They'll smell the blood on the floor. They'll see all of the different factors that made you wounded. You may not say anything. You may put a bandaid on the wound, but other people see it. And it's just like when you see somebody that's wounded, they're carrying a wound. They just went through a divorce. They just went through something horrific, a loss of a family member. Somebody fired them. Something horrible happened. But you can see the disaster that's underneath that. The Band-Aid doesn't help. It doesn't tell the story. But when you share it and when you forgive, it lets you go. You're the one that gets released from it. You're the one that has closure from it. We don't always get closure, and I hear people say that all the time. Well, I just didn't get closure in that instance. It may not happen. But as you release, and here's the other thing. It's going to keep coming up for you. You're going to think about it another way. Well, here's another thing. Well, they said this. Well, they did that. You know, how am I going to? So you're going to be wrestling with this. Forgiveness is active. And it was for Jesus, too, because at the cross, he said, forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. But what about you and I? We weren't even born yet. But have we sinned against him? Have we wronged him and wounded him? Yeah, because it's by uh, his stripes, we're healed right here in this time and space. It was ongoing. It's an active process, and you have to know that forgiveness is like that. And I said this morning in the Bible study that forgiveness is the deep end of the pond. It's the real work that Christians do. We're not just commanded to do it. We should do it, and when we don't do it, honestly, we're the ones that are damaged goods as a result. Forgiveness is deep. It's something that we need to practice. And um, we can't heal until we do. And that's either as a group, individually, or as a nation. God hears those things because he is quick to forgive you and I. Why can't we be the same way? All right, moving right along, use your voice. So we often hear, uh, see something, say something. How many people have heard that expression? Oh, yeah, it's all over the place. So if we see something that's wrong, we should say something. We have a thing in Judaism. It's a, it's a thing. It's a whole thing. It's called tikkun olam, repairing the world. And for some people, that can be controversial. But if we see something a wrong or injustice or something that uh, needs to be corrected, well, guess what? Especially as children of God, as children of the book, we should be the ones that say something about it. We should be the ones who take the action step. If you don't say anything, it's as good as saying, well, I agree. Well, I don't care. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, if they get hurt, it doesn't affect me. It happened to my neighbor, but mm, I don't need any of that. I'm in my life, I'm going to live in my world, you live in yours. But honestly, that's how woundedness stays wounded. What if you were a person and your arm was broken or you had a gaping wound and you're not going to say anything, you're just going to hide the wound and you're not going to go seek medical care? How horrible a thing would that be? Or if you saw it of the person and they're scared, they're in shock, but you didn't say anything or you didn't act on it, you just let them die. How horrible a thing. But we do the same thing when we don't use our voice, when we see injustice, when we see things are wrong, or even if we misunderstand something, we should seek clarity about it. So many things have changed in our country and in our world because we saw something that was wrong and we spoke to it. 
Why we still have the freedom of speech in our country, we should talk about it. But especially as it relates to us, we should talk about it. And when we do, we should be forgiving and listening as we go forward. Those are important things. Those are probably three of the most important things I could share, and especially this next one, pray. There are so many things that are out of our control that we can't see them. Uh, we don't know that they're coming. We don't know that they're a consequence of whatever the action is or the negative thing is or the wound is. We don't know what those things are, but we can pray about it. And wherever two or more are gathered, or you just yourself, you can pray about it. How many times have we prayed for people in this congregation or prayed for our community and we watch stuff happen? We watch people get better. We knew that God was hearing us. I tell jokes and they're funny to me and God's like, mm -hmm, yeah, you're going to have a Russian boy. <laughs> Good luck with that. And he blessed it. It bore fruit. Those are the things that are important to us. They bear fruit. They're important. And um, um, we need to pray. We need to pray a lot more. We need to pray together. Because when we lift somebody up that's not us, it's not, oh, woe is me, or God, you know, uh, the Janis Joplin prayer, uh, Lord, won't you send me a Mercedes Benz? <laughs> I had to go there, 60s. Um, but when we pray for other people, intercessory prayer, it's a high order of prayer. This morning, again, in the Bible study, we talked about what can hinder your prayers. Be mean to your wife and see what happens. Yeah. Does God have every right to like, <laughs> I'm not listening to him. You better listen to her. Listen to her first. Yeah. Intercessory prayer is powerful. It's one of the things that we're responsible to. When we have to answer to the things that God said, hey, what were you faithful in? Who did you feed? Who did you help? He's going he's gonna to talk to us about it. Did you talk to me about that? Did you help somebody? It's going to come up in conversation. If you believe in Jesus and you're more than just a believer, but you're a follower too, know that you'll probably give an answer to that. Why didn't you talk to me about it? I would have helped you, but you didn't. Sometimes our prayers are hindered because we're not helping. We're thinking about ourselves or we're not doing something that we should be doing. So I'm starting to sound preachy now, aren't I? Yeah. Wow. Did I prick any? Okay. The other thing I wanted to say, too, was um, set some boundaries. I'm going to go to a sixth thing, too. And I'm just going to throw this in for good measure. But set some boundaries. If you know that something is wrong, by all means, make that a boundary. Make that a boundary marker. I was talking to a couple that uh, are going to re, uh, get married, and I said, did you read Townsend McLeod's book on boundaries in marriage? Because everybody has them. If you're a guy, um, basically, if your wife disrespects you, you're going to have problems. Those boundary walls are going to shoot up. If you don't love your wife, as if she's just finer than China, the very best there is, only I have eyes for you, you're going to have problems because you're not going to show the kind of love. And I want to say for men, love is a challenge. Well, ah, no, we want to see respect. And for women, it's like, I can love you, but I can't respect you. Has anybody ever heard those terms? Oh, yeah. And I want to say, relationally, we can hurt each other in that way. We can wound each other in our relationships, our closest relationships. We can hurt each other in that way. Knowing what your boundaries are, this church has boundaries and walls to the outside. It keeps nature out. We have nature here and a little fruit. But for the most part, it keeps stuff out that are unwanted. Boundaries in our relationships and in the things that we do, they do the same thing. You need to be clear about what your boundaries are and also as an organization. What will you allow? What will you not allow? And so, very important, set the boundaries, know what they are, discuss them amongst yourselves because they're important. You have them, you just may not have identified what they are, but you have boundaries. The last thing I want to mention uh, on this list, and I guess it's item number six, 
would be self-reflection. By all means, with prayer and supplication, do reflect on the choices that you make, the relationships that you have, the wounds that you've received, and the forgiveness that you're going to give, you know. And it's up to you, honestly, how you do that. Should you? Absolutely. Will you? We hope so. No one can force you to do that, but you will give an account for it. You should. Because the things that you forgive in, you'll also be forgiven in too. It's a powerful thing. Jesus doesn't make that statement idly. All of us have been wounded, and he wears his wounds for eternity. Could he change that? He absolutely could. Would you miss the point? You would. Yeah, you absolutely would miss the point. Jesus wears the scars for us. He loves us. And so sometimes we can tolerate things for others because we love them. Love covers a multitude of sins. I've just kind of rattled off some scripture without reference point, but love covers a multitude of sins. If you're willing to forgive somebody, they'll be forgiven. Your word is enough. God accepts it. He does so much in counsel with us. It's unbelievable. Why would he ever pick us as a partner for <laughs> world peace and just peace in the home? But he does. So I wanted to say those things, you know, in reference to forgiveness. And uh, I'm kind of going to go over these closing points. So that means I'm going to move to the close. No trial close. I'm just going to kind of move right in. So many of us have been wounded, um, whether it's mauled by lions, uh, mauled by people, circumstances, world events, other people who have uh, hurt us. Um, but how are we going to handle that ourselves? What kind of choices are we going to make as a result of our woundedness? You're a human being. You're going to be wounded. You're going to get hurt in this life. And uh, you're probably not going to come out of it alive. But the good news is that Christ offers life eternal. There's hope with him. There's hope that we're going to be better and we're going to live to a better tomorrow. He is wounded for us. The other thing I'd say is do talk. Practice Matthew chapter 18. Talk amongst yourselves. Have a cup of coffee. Pray. Forgive. Understand. Give the other person opportunity to state their, their woundedness, their, their grieving, the thing that hurt them. Give them the opportunity to talk about those things because they're important. When you do that, you're not just being sympathetic or you're not just entertaining them. You're actually sharing the burden with them. And that's what Jesus does with us. He shares that burden. He practices forgiveness for us, for me, constantly, every day. I'm sure the Lord's like, didn't I, didn't I just forgive you for that? And you went ahead and done it again. Man, yeah, you again. <laughs> Why are you telling me this? Yeah. So that stuff happens. We have to be the same kind of people. Jesus talked about forgiveness in how many times? He talked about it with Peter. How many times do you forgive your brother? Seventy times seven? but it's basically a multitude. How many times has Jesus forgiven us for the same sin over and over again? Yeah, over and over again. Discuss, share, make it whole again if it's anything by you. Um, and we can create a better outcome by the fact that we did come together and finally, I want you to think on this particular scripture. We're gonna... Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will hear my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. We never have to fear those things because nevertheless, God will make it happen. He will bring us health. He will heal us. And oftentimes, we didn't even have to ask him for it. He already knows in advance that we're wounded. He already knows that we're broken people. We're broken right from the very start. What happens is we realize it. 
other people have not. You're going to be wounded in this life many times. But how you deal with that and how you seek him, that's important. And he will provide enjoyment, abundant peace and security. And so the word for peace, it's a unique word. It's the word shalom. Shalom is unique in so many ways because it's not just the absence of war. It's not just peace in our English or Western sense. Shalom is, it's the peace of well-being. It's a peace that really does surpass all understanding. It's when you feel good about who you are and who you are in God. You feel good about it, no matter what happens, no matter what's going on. Uh, things could be blowing up all around you, but that shalom, that's internal. That's something that only he can provide. That's the peace when the kingdom comes to this planet. That's the peace that he'll provide. He'll walk around. You'll pick fruit from your Mediterranean garden in Jerusalem. You'll eat it. Maybe not a lemon. <laughs> you'll eat it, and you'll have peace of mind. But you can have that today. You can have that today in Christ Jesus because of who he is and he wants you to be healed as he's healed. I'm going to close out this sermon series and I'm going to go back to our trophy. I brought back an uh, Academy Award for my wife from Hollywood, California while I was there. She gets her own trophy. She gets an Oscar. <laughs> But this is still my trophy, uh, the wounded heart. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds from Psalm 147.3. This is important because this is all of us. We all get this trophy in some way. And God puts more than a Band-Aid on our heart. He promises to fully heal us. Whatever things or afflictions that we feel today, he can lift all of those away. But he promises in eternity that he'll wipe away every tear. Everything that's shed or hurt or harmful to us, he'll remove. We can trust him with our hearts and with our lives. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for bringing us together this morning. And Lord, uh, bearing our wounds and discussing them and how that we're going to go forward and deal with those things. We're going to identify them. We're going to pray about them. We're going to lift them up to you. We're going to talk to ourselves. And Father, we're going to forgive because you forgive. And there's healing in that. There's healing for our world. And most of all, there's healing for us too. Father, send your spirit. Send your spirit upon us. Reveal those things to us that would need to be revealed. Lord, quicken us and we'll be quickened. Speak to us and Lord, let us hear. Father, let us be the faithful servants that you've called us to be. Full in relationship, full emotionally, and full in caring, and mostly full in forgiveness. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and I pray for everyone in our congregation, everyone that hears us on the internet. Father, we praise you, thank you, and we give you the glory for our healing. Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, amen.